to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Many times when presented with the truth on baptism and being essential to salvation, people raise the objection, what about the thief on the cross? Well, friend, we welcome you today to our study of that subject. Is the thief on the cross a good reason not to be baptized today for the remission of your sins? That's the question we're going to answer from the Word of God, and we're so glad that you joined us for our lesson today. As always, this lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church and congregations of God's people in your local area. Those members of the Lord's Church will be happy for you to stop by and visit them. Come to their services on Sunday or Wednesday. You'll find people there who want to study the Bible, who love the truth, and are concerned about the souls of men and women today. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you've got a Bible question, if you want to know more about salvation, or you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any lesson that we've done, those are all free and available to you. You can download them free of charge from our website, or you can get them on DVD or CD. We'll be happy to mail those to you. We have study questions and transcripts and just a wide variety of good Bible study material that's all free from our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and we'd love for you to look that up on the web and access us, or you could call and write to us as well, and we'd be happy to help you in your study of the Word of God. Here's how it sometimes goes. When sometimes people are presented with the truth on baptism, they begin to raise objections. For example, the Bible with great clarity teaches baptism is essential to salvation. Listen to these verses. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. The Bible says there that unless you believe and unless you're baptized, you cannot be saved. The Bible does not teach that you're baptized after you're saved. It teaches you're baptized, then you're saved. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Baptism is not because of you've been forgiven of sins. It's to be forgiven. And so I can't be forgiven until I'm baptized. It's essential to be forgiven of sin. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism does now also save us. And so baptism removes sins and baptism is essential to be saved. 1 Peter 3.21, Jesus said in John 3 verse 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. I've got to be born of water to get in God's kingdom. And Saul of Tarsus was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Those passages so clearly teach that you are not saved one moment before you're baptized. But people will often raise objections to that. Even though those passages are very clear, teachings are very crisp, People often, many times because of denominational prejudice, will raise objections to this idea. And probably one of the most well-known that we hear the most is, what about the thief on the cross? Now, here's how the basic argument would go. Okay, you're saying baptism is essential to salvation, but what about this idea? The thief was not baptized. Jesus said to the thief, Today you'll be with me in paradise. The thief was saved. Therefore, baptism's not essential to salvation. Now again, just the basics of the argument. Thief wasn't baptized. The thief was saved. Therefore, baptism cannot be essential to salvation. Now friend, that sounds, and in some aspects from the outset, someone might say, well, hey, that kind of sounds logical. For, a, for an argument to reach a logical conclusion, 
every part of the argument must be both valid and true. The, uh, the different legs, the different parts of the argument must be true. And so we want to examine today if this argument is really sound and valid and true, and you'll notice from the scripture that its parts are clearly not something one could prove. Now, we do no doubt find the account of the thief in scripture, Matthew 27, uh, Mark 15, and probably one of the most well-known, Luke chapter 23. The basic story is, as you read those three accounts, is that Jesus was crucified between two thieves, with a thief on the right hand, thief on the left. One of those thieves eventually came to his senses and said to the Lord, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus did say to him, Today you'll be with me in paradise. But friend, is that thief going to be the excuse for ignoring what the Bible teaches on a multiplicity and a multiplicity of passages today? Well, let's examine this idea. As we said, the first part of this syllogism, the first part of this argument, the opening line is, the thief was never baptized. Friend, what's wrong with this whole argument? It's unprovable and it's absolutely based on assumption and supposition. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. The very first part of this argument, the thief was never baptized, is completely and absolutely based on assumption. What do you mean? Well, listen carefully. For this argument to be true, you have to prove the thief was never baptized. Did you know you cannot do that one way or the other? Now someone says, well, you can't say that he was. I'm not trying to. You can't say what neither. What's the point? You can't know one way or the other. The Bible doesn't say one way or the other if the thief was or was not baptized. Friend, if that's true, and it absolutely is, the whole argument falls flat right then and there. If you cannot get your Bible and prove the thief was never baptized, this whole argument is a straw man. And friend, it absolutely is. It is based, this argument is based on a false assumption. People say, well, the thief was never baptized. Prove it. Get your Bible out and prove the thief was never baptized. Well, you can't. Get your Bible out and prove he was. Well, you can't. What's the point? You can't prove either way. Then, friend, if that's true, this whole argument is dead in the water. And no one can ever say the thief proves baptism is not essential unto salvation. Now, in every other area of life, I'm not going to base the way I live off an assumption. Let's say, uh, you know, you've got this pill bottle at the house and you say, well, I, I guess this is probably what the doctor gave me and if I take it, I'll be okay. I'm not going to assume that. I'll take that medicine, I might die if it's not. This might be what the doctor gave me. Like, no, I'm not going to assume that. I assume that I pay my bill. No, you don't assume things. Prove it. You cannot prove the thief was never baptized. Therefore, that part of the argument is not valid. It's not a sound argument because it's based absolutely off of assumption. Anytime the person says to you or someone says to you, hey, the thief on the cross is never baptized, just say, well, how do you know that? Prove that in the Bible. Well, you can't prove it either way. Therefore, that argument is not a good argument. Here's what we do know. The Bible teaches Christians don't assume. Someone say, well, I think he was probably, uh-uh. The Bible teaches Christians don't assume. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. If you can't prove it, don't believe it. You cannot prove the thief was not baptized. You cannot prove he was baptized. Therefore, he's not usable as a, an excuse for people to ignore the Bible's teaching about baptism today. But let's examine this idea a little further. You know, I could probably, and we're not necessarily saying this is the case, but you could, come, you could come a lot closer to saying the thief was a religious man and may have been even a follower of Jesus than you could to say that uh, he was a, an infidel or something like that. Uh, the thief very well could have been a follower of Jesus and very well could have been baptized under the baptism of John. He was, the thief was not just some out-and-out -out criminal. You look at what the thief knew, and his knowledge suggests he had some inside knowledge that even some of the disciples didn't have. Uh, he goes on, here's some of the things that the thief acknowledges in the various accounts. Matthew 27, Mark 15, uh, Luke 23. He acknowledges the existence of God. He, he realizes Jesus is Lord or he is God. Lord, remember me. 
The very fact that he acknowledged who Jesus was as Lord, as Master, as Owner tells us that this man had some religious upbringing. He had a religious background at least. He knew there was a Lord and a God. He knew there was a standard of right and wrong. You remember what the, the man on the cross said? He said, hey, we're here for things we've done and we deserve to be here in essence. This man hasn't done anything. What did that man know? He knew there was a standard of right and wrong. He knew they deserved to be on the cross for the things they've done. He wasn't somebody who was living a life based off of no standards. He knew, hey, we've messed up. We deserve to be up here. There's a standard of right and wrong and we're getting what we deserve. This man, not so much. What else did the uh, thief on the cross know? The thief on the cross knew that Christ was a king. Remember me, listen to this, when you come into your kingdom. Now friend, how did he know Christ was a king? By acknowledging Jesus as king of the kingdom. You remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, you know, when you think about this idea, there are several things that are really important about his uh, teaching or what he knew here. But just for this point, he noticed Christ. And he realized that Christ was the king uh, of his kingdom. Here's another thing he knew. He believed that death would not stop Christ's kingdom. You know, this is something that even Jesus' apostles and disciples really didn't get until the end. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, the, the disciples are standing there gazing up into heaven saying, Lord, will you now deliver the kingdom to Israel? They hadn't got it yet. This man knows you don't come down from a cross. People who go on crosses don't come down from them. And he says to Jesus, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He understands that death, he believed that death would not stop and prevent Christ's kingdom from being established. What else did this man know? He believed there'd be a remembrance in eternity. He knew Jesus had that power. Remember me. He didn't believe that death was the end. Oh, there were people who did in Jesus' day. There were people who believed that when you died, you died and you're dead all over and that was it. He realized there was remembrance. There was something on the other side. Uh, when you think about that, you know, that tells us he had a little bit of a knowledge of religious matters. He believed in the perfection of Christ. This man hasn't done anything deserving of death. He knew something about the way Christ had lived his life. Now, friend, that again kind of goes against the grain of what a majority of people thought. A lot of people thought Jesus deserved to be up there, that Jesus was a hoax or a, a blasphemer or he was a trickster. This man, he knew about the perfection of Christ, that he was not getting what he deserved. Do you know this man believed in the resurrection of Christ? Remember me when you come into your kingdom? Again, people didn't come down from crosses. What's he saying? That Jesus is going to not be contained in the grave. That he's going to come out of that grave and that his kingdom is going to be a kingdom that rules all other kingdoms. And so when you think about that idea, the, this thief is not just some common criminal necessarily. This is a man who understands somewhat more than even Jesus' disciples did about the kingdom. He understands a lot about Christ. He has things and knowledge about the other side. Very likely, this man had a religious background. In fact, although the Bible never says either way, you could come a lot closer in the Scripture to proving this man was baptized than you could that he wasn't. How do we know that? Think about these passages. Matthew 3, verses 5 through 6. Mark 1, verses 4 through 5. John 4, verses 1 through 3 says this, All those in Jerusalem, Judea, and all the regions round about went out to John to be baptized by him. Now, where's this man crucified with Jesus at? In Jerusalem. All right, now let's think about this. How do you know he wasn't one of those people who was already baptized by John? Well, you don't know. And we admit that point readily, and that proves the whole argument is uh, not a valid one. Friend, you could sure come a lot closer to saying he might have been one of those people there during the baptism of John, and he might have already been baptized. You could come a lot closer to proving that he was baptized than that he wasn't, although, again, the point being, the fact that we don't know proves this is not a good and solid argument. And so here's the point. Listen carefully now. The thief on the cross may or may not have been baptized. We don't know. But, friend, the fact that the Bible does not say and that we don't know makes this argument invalid 
and illogical. Now remember, here's the argument. Thief on the, proof, thief on the cross was never baptized. The thief was saved. Therefore, baptism is not essential to salvation. Every one of those points has to be provable for that argument to be true. And the first one falls flat on, flat on its face. Was the thief baptized? Was he not baptized? The Bible doesn't say. Therefore, the thief is not an example proving that baptism is not essential unto salvation. A friend, I want you to think about this also. Not only is the argument unsound, invalid, and illogical because it's not provable, but the thief would not be a proper example for New Testament salvation for us today. Think about this. I'm not going to use, nor is someone who's trying to follow the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament, any of these examples as how to be saved. I'm not going to use Noah. I'm not going to do what Noah did to be saved. I'm not going to do what Moses did. I'm not going to go off for sacrifice. I'm not going to build an ark. I'm not going to do what Abraham did to be saved. I'm not going to follow the pattern David had or what King Hezekiah or anybody on the Old Testament did. Why? Because those are Old Testament examples of salvation. Uh, the, the thief on the cross, he lived and died under the Old Testament. Listen now. Colossians 2 verse 14 says that the old law was nailed to the cross. Ephesians uh, 2, 14 and 15, the, the law of commandments written in order says it was, it was done away with at the cross. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, promised that a new covenant would be coming. And Hebrews 8 says that is the covenant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, Hebrews 9, 15 through 17 teaches us that those who died under the old covenant, they also, by obeying the will of God, could be saved. But they're not saved the same way we are today. I'm not saved like Moses or Abraham or David or Noah or any of those people. There was a different method then. Animal sacrifices, the blood of Christ went backward toward them as well, but they're never told to uh, repent or be baptized in the sense of obeying the gospel. Now, here's the point. The thief on the cross, he lived and died under the Old Testament. I want you to notice Hebrews 9. There's a point in time point in history that is very important to understand and for this reason Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now watch this, for where there is a testament there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force, watch this, after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. When did the, when did the New Testament of our Lord and Savior go into force? Well, at the cross. And from the, that point to the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2, we have that period where it's going into force. Now, think about this. If the New Testament began at the cross and the Old Testament ended there, at what point do we have the thief? Well, the thief asked that question prior to Jesus' death on the cross. Therefore, he's under that Old Testament period of law, not the New Testament. He would not be a, a New Testament example of salvation any more than any other person on the Old Testament, Moses or Abraham or David or any of those people. He lived and died under the Old Law. He asked that question while the Old Law is still in force. Jesus answered that while he was alive. The New Testament has not gone into effect yet. Therefore, he's not an example of New Testament salvation for us today. And so he lived under the old law. We live under the new law of Christ today. He lived on that side of the cross. We live on this side of the cross. Although he may have been closer than some, he still lived under the Old Testament side of the cross. And then, friend, we also know this. While Jesus was alive, he had the power and the ability to forgive sins on this earth. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus said the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. He, he on multiple occasions did that. But friend, here's the point that we want to make. When Jesus died, His New Testament went into place. He's no longer here on earth with us. He left His last will and testament. He left His directives on what men and women are to do today and today. I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. John 12 verse 48, the scripture says, Jesus speaking, he who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him, the word that I've spoken 
will judge him in the last day. While Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins, he's left us his last will and testament. I'm going to be judged by that word. And friend, it's what the Bible says, what Jesus' words in the New Testament say, that I've got to follow today to be saved. And so when you think about these ideas, please realize the thief on the cross is not a valid, not a sound argument, uh, objection to one being baptized. Why would you want to object? to what is so clearly taught in the New Testament anyway. Friend, this is not just something that has a, a scant passage or a, a scarce passage here or there. Friend, the Bible teaches on, in multiple places that to contact the death of Jesus that saves and the blood of Jesus that saves, I have to be baptized into His death. Let me again mention some of those clear passages to you. In Mark 16, 16, I want you to notice it in your own Bible. Get, notice your Bible. Mark chapter 16, here's what Jesus said in verse number 16. And Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Now question, did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? Well, friend, there's no denying. That's exactly what Jesus said. Now, you contrast that with how men look at it today. Some people say, you're baptized and you're saved, then you believe later. So baptism, salvation, then belief. That's not Mark 16, 16. Some people say, you believe, then you're saved, later you're baptized. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you believe and are baptized, then you're saved. That's what the Bible teaches. You're not saved before you're baptized, like multiplied millions of people teach and are taught concerning salvation. Think about the clarity of the first gospel sermon, Acts 2 verse 38. Peter preaches, therefore, let all the house of Israel, verse 36, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They get the point. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're cut to the heart. And the answer in Acts 2.38 is, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Friend, Acts 2.38 teaches baptism is for or in order to have your sins removed. Someone says, well, how do you know that? Uh, how do we understand that? I want you to compare uh, a, a similar Greek syntax in the New Testament which helps us to understand that. And it's Matthew 26, 28. This is very easy to understand. Let's take a similar phraseology in the New Testament and let's see if we can understand that. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, as He instituted the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. Now what in the world does for the remission of sins mean there? Does it mean because of? I'm, I'm, I'm shedding my blood because the world's sins have already been forgiven? Well, of course not. It means Jesus died in order that for the purpose of the world's sins being forgiven. Same phraseology, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Why are you baptized? For the purpose of contacting the blood of Jesus, Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 3 and 4, which saves men and women from sin. Then think about this passage, Acts chapter 22. Let me, let, me, let me give you the history of it first. Acts chapter 9, Saul and Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is going to do great harm to the Lord's church. He's on the road to Damascus with official letters. Uh, if he finds any of the way, he's going to put him in prison. The Lord confronts him in Acts chapter 9. Saul, Saul, why persecute? Why are you persecuting me? Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus. Uh, go, hard for you to kick against the goat. Go in the city and be told you what you must do, the Lord says to him. We understand what exactly the Lord told him to do by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Acts 22. God told Ananias to go to the street called Straight. There'd be a man named Saul there. Ananias goes to Saul. And in Acts 22, 16, here's what he says. Saul. Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. My friend, I don't want you to miss this idea. The scriptures teach sin separates me from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, The soul who sins shall surely die. 
Friend, if it's sin that separates me from God, whatever moment in time sins are forgiven, that's when I contact the death, the blood, and the sacrifice of Jesus. And friend, I know exactly from the Scripture when that happened. Ananias said, Saul, you need to arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. You contact the sacrifice and the death of Jesus when you do what God says to contact it. Romans 6 verses 3 through 4 says, we're baptized into His death. We contact the death of Jesus when we're buried with Him in water in baptism. And then think about this passage that is so clear. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if the Bible says baptism saves, why would anybody say it's not essential to salvation? Why would you want to look for examples like the thief on the cross that, that is not valid or logical, not sound? Why would you want to use that if the Bible says, Baptism does now also save us. If God says it saves, wouldn't it just be easier to accept what God says and do it? Then I know I've got my faith on the Bible. Then I know I've, I've done what the Scripture says. Then I know I have followed a multiplicity of passages that are teaching that. Jesus said in John 3 verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be born of water. Again, representing the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. And then Galatians 3 verse 27. Now remember, salvation's in Christ. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. All, or 2 Timothy 2 verse 10. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. The question is, how does a man who's in sin get out of sin and in Christ? Well, Galatians 3.27 tells us, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You know how the Bible teaches us to get into Christ? We're baptized into Christ. And so, friend, I understand maybe people have been told the thief on the cross is a good example of why you don't have to be baptized. I hope today you've seen that argument doesn't hold any weight at all. It's not sound, it's not valid, it's not logical. The very first line of it is an assumption, and the Bible clearly teaches, I must be baptized to be saved. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? If not, friend, we beg you to do that today before it's everlastingly too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one.